uh, where are we? July 16th, 2020 meeting of the Salt Lake City Historic Landmarks Commission is now in session. And I, Kenton Peters, Salt Lake City Historic Landmark Commission Chair, hereby determine that conducting the Salt Lake City Historic Landmark Commission meeting at an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the anchor location. The World Health Organization, the President of the United States, the Governor of Utah, the Salt Lake County Health Department, Salt Lake County Mayor, and the Mayor of Salt Lake City have all recognized a global pandemic exists related to the new strain of the coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. Due to the state of emergency caused by the global pandemic, I find that conducting a meeting at an anchor location under the current state of public health emergency constitutes a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who may be present at the location. Moreover, the city and county building, which is the anchor location for Salt Lake City Historic Landmark Commission meetings, is presently closed for regular occupation due to damages sustained during the March 2020 earthquakes. And now I should move into the opening statement. Welcome to the Historic Landmark Commission. The Historic Landmark Commission is made up of citizens of the city who are appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the city council. The commission primarily does three things. We make recommendations to the City Council on policies and ordinances related to preservation of Salt Lake City. This includes the designation of local historic districts and landmark sites. As a certified local government, provide input to the Utah State Historic Preservation Office, SHPO, regarding National Register nominations within the city. We are also charged with reviewing and making decisions on land use applications for properties that are located within the Historic Preservation Overlay District. This includes design review of building alterations, demolitions, economic hardship requests, construction of new buildings, special exceptions, and historic building relocation. It is up to the applicant to present their project and provide evidence that shows how their project complies with the specific standards of review. The planning staff is here to let us know why we are reviewing an application, what standards we need to use in making a decision, and point out the key issues. The role of the public is to help us identify the issues and impacts of the proposed project and provide input on how they think the project complies or does not comply with the standards of review for which the Historic Landmark Commission has authority over. On items where the City Council is the decision maker, opinions may be considered. Our goal is to have a welcoming and safe environment for everyone. To reach that goal, we ask that those in virtual attendance adhere to a few ground rules. Silence or turn off your cell phones. And since we are virtual, please try to limit background noise or turn off mute your microphones when you are not speaking. Uh, respect the person speaking. If you wish to speak, uh, I believe you can raise your hand and the uh, the meeting host will be able to call your name and allow you two minutes to speak. Your time cannot be combined with someone else's time. Everyone will get the same amount of time to speak so that we can ensure everyone is treated equally. Uh, handouts may not be relevant to this. Uh, if you have one, we can figure out what to do. Keep your comments on topic and succinct. The next thing on the agenda would be the approval of minutes for the June 4th, 2020 meeting. Uh, commissioners who are present, hopefully you've read those minutes and are willing to uh, approve or, or disapprove them. Could I have a motion in that direction, please? Okay, someone? So moved. Very good. We have a, we have a motion to approve the minutes from uh, June 4th. Can we have a second, please? Second. Thank you, Paul. Uh, 
Let's take a, a, a vote then. We have a motion and a second to approve. Um, Michael, do you approve of the minutes? Aye. Very good. Jessica? Aye. And Victoria? Since you made the motion, I assume you approve. I will take that as an aye. And likewise, with Paul seconding the motion. So those minutes, yes, yes sir. Kenton, we also have um, Commissioner Mora on. I cannot move her as a panelist right now. Um, no. So I'm going to unmute. So uh, there you go, Rocio. Can you hear us okay? Hey, yes. Okay. Um, and what I can do is just um, raise my hand every time I have something to say. And if you want to just unmute me then, does that work? Uh, we will. I'll do that. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Sorry oh, thank about that. You. Okay. Thanks for pointing that out. Rocio, uh, do you approve of the minutes? Approve, yes. Very good. That's approved. Let's move on. Report of the chair. I'm the chair. Uh, only report I have is perhaps everyone knows that uh, Commissioner uh, Esters is stepping down. We appreciate her service and wish her best of luck as she moves on to her next step. I believe it's a city commission on uh, on racial matters, which is outstanding. Mm -hmm. Great place for her. Uh, we will be seeking a replacement, uh, someone to fill her seat. And that is in process. That's all I have to report. And I don't believe uh, Robert is in, so I don't have a vice chair. Uh, let's move to Nick. Uh, do you have a director's report for us, please? So, uh, the only thing I have to report is that Commissioner Evans has indicated that he does not want to be reappointed. So we'll have another vacancy. We have um, a number of Apple, um, people who have applied to the reviewing are also reviewing the, or, um, the people who are up for reappointments as well. So um, we'll let everybody know as soon as we um, hear something about anybody. So, um, Rocio, do you, let's see if I can meet. Do you have a, a question, Rocio? Oh, there we go. All right, that's all I had. Okay. Thank you. Well, good. Nick, you, uh, you broke up, as you said, who was not re-upping. Which commissioner? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Adams, Stanley Adams. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, that's, that's interesting news too. So, commissioners who are present, I guess we've all got to be in our best behavior now if we're being reviewed. And uh, let us move on to the first and only item on the agenda. Uh, not a real straightforward one, so we'll have an interesting discussion, I expect. Uh, historic Carriage House Zoning Text Amendment. And I believe uh, Kelsey Lindquist is our staff person on this. So uh, please let the show go on, Kelsey. Okay, good evening. Let me just load my presentation. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay. Perfect. Yes. So before I get started, I, I do have a question for the chair. I'm hoping to go through the proposed language. Uh, for the first first part of the presentation and then turn it back over to the commission for a public hearing. And then once that public hearing is closed to go through all of the listed questions and discussion points with the commission. Yeah, that makes sense. Kelsey, as I've read through this, I was certainly hoping you would lead us through all of the nuances of this because it's pretty complex. So I think the way you propose laying it out is going to work nicely. Perfect. Okay, well, then I will just get started. Okay, so this is a request for a zoning text amendment petition from Kirk Huffaker, the applicant representative on behalf of Stephen Pace, 
to permit the restoration or reconstruction of a historic carriage house for the purposes of creating a dwelling unit. Stephen Pace, the property owner of the Beer Estate located at 222 4th Ave and 181 North B, is requesting the proposed amendment in an effort to provide an incentive to reconstruct or restore a historic carriage house on his property. The applicant has been working with planning on a solution to rest restore the existing carriage house, which is highlighted in the aerial map on the screen. Just to the, the rear of the harness shop on 222 4th Ave. Uh, the subject carriage house is associated with the Bear Estate landmark site, which was constructed by Richard Cletting. This is an image of the carriage house from the 70s. This is an aerial of the subject carriage house with the harness shop on front, in front facing 4th Avenue. So the, the applicant, through working with staff, <laughs> several barriers within the Salt Lake City Zoning Ordinance uh, to reconstruct this carriage house. And those barriers include the following. The dwelling unit located within a restored or reconstructed carriage house would be considered to be a single family detached dwelling. Adding another single family dwelling to this property at the proposed location would not be allowed because all principal structures must be located along a street frontage. Uh, the home, essentially the reconstructed carriage house, would be located in back of the existing principal structure on the property. The zoning district where the property is located, which is RMF 35, requires a minimum of 5,000 square feet per single family dwelling. So a total of 10,000 square feet would be required for two single family dwellings. The subject property is only approximately 8,184 square feet in size. So it does not meet that minimum size requirement. The carriage house would also not meet building setback requirements and regulations due to its close proximity to the side and rear property lines. Additionally, staff and the applicant researched the potential of an ADU, converting this carriage house into an ADU. And there were several issues um, raised with that proposal as well. The ADU would permit an additional unit to the rear of the property. However, there's a conflict with the um, owner occupancy requirement due to the owner does not live on the property. And the size limitations of ADUs would not accommodate the traditional size of the historic carriage house. So at this time, staff will go through the outline of the proposed language that's within the staff report. Um, and as mentioned, I've created slides with the listed questions and guidance, which I will go to after the public hearing portion. So a, a typical ordinance format includes the following sections, includes a purpose statement, which is what are the regulations trying to achieve, definition of terms applicable to those regulations, um, Applicability, what conditions must be met for the regulations to apply. Process, who is the decision maker and what is the decision making process. And the standards or criteria, what are the specific regulations pertaining to the application. The purpose of the proposed language, the Historic Carriage House Reconstruction Text Amendment, would be to permit the reconstruction or restoration of a carriage house for the purposes of creating a dwelling unit. Staff included the following as potential for the purpose statement. Um, and it goes as follows, incentivize the preservation and restoration of a historic feature on a landmark site, add to the housing units within Salt Lake City while respecting the appearance and scale of single family residential neighborhoods. Sustainability objectives are supported by utilizing an existing structure or elements of an existing structure. Increase the economic viability of historic properties and further the city's historic preservation goals. 
Um, in regards to the definitions, the applicant did provide the definition that you can see in the SAF report for Terrace House. Uh, for the property to be considered eligible, it must be listed as a Salt Lake City landmark, as well as a National Register of Historic Places site. The property must be located in one of the following zoning districts. They include the RMF 35, the RO, the SR1A, and I, which is the Institutional Zoning District. There must be substantial evidence that a carriage house exists or existed on the subject property. The burden of proof would be on the applicant and would be provided through two of the following methods. Historic photographs, Sanborn fire insurance maps, planning, zoning, or building permit records, identifiable surviving structural elements. Um, in regards to process, there's not a specific process that has been identified. However, the proposed language implies that the design, construction, and alterations would require a certificate of appropriateness from the Landmark Commission. The applicant proposes the following standards and criteria. The reconstruction or restored carriage house would only be allowed to be used for single family residents. Off-street parking would be required for the dwelling unit. The restored or reconstructed carriage house would be limited to the historic footprint of that structure. If it is determined that there are negative impacts to abutting properties, buffers would be required. The site has a clean record in regards to enforcement um, and building code violations. The two residences could not be subdivided in the future. The property owner is not required to permanently reside on the property. And base zoning restrictions, such as lot coverage, setbacks, height, and density could be modified. Uh, so the, the purpose of this hearing is so that the Landmark Commission can review the proposed regulations and make recommendations for the Planning Commission's consideration. And at this time, I would like to turn it back over to the commission and I would be happy to go through those questions and requested guidance after the public hearing. Okay, uh, Kelsey, was uh, Kurt Kufferker going to add to the presentation? I do not believe he, they have a presentation, but I believe he would like to speak, so. Okay, uh, would, seems like this might be an appropriate time for him to, uh, to weigh in on this. So please go ahead, Kirk, if you'd like. Okay, um, you, you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, Th thank you, um, Chair Peters. Um, again, good evening, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for your dedicated service to the city, its historic districts, and your time to consider this application. Uh, I'm Kirk Huffaker. Uh, principal of Kirk Huffaker Preservation Strategies, and I'm a consultant to the property owner, Stephen Pate. Uh, I'm gonna present a, a brief introduction, uh, kind of a high level overview, and then Stephen, uh, hopefully he was able to get on uh, via telephone. Uh, he'll provide some additional comments. Uh, both uh, Stephen and I uh, want to thank Kelsey for her work and patience during the last several months to bring this application to the, this point in the process. Uh, we're fortunate to have her expertise and professionalism in the planning division. Um, Kelsey's purpose, uh, the, the statements that she made under, under talking about the purpose of this is correct. It's a little bit about all of those, but truly the purpose of this and where we start uh, for this application uh, is to reconstruct the historic carriage house as it was in circa 1900 at this property. Uh, the owner has been on a 30 plus year quest to bring the estate of William Beer back to its original stature through his dedication to historic preservation. The carriage house is that last piece of that historic estate. If we take off our zoning hats for a minute, to consider the, the wider view of this historic site. 
let's look at that interpretation. While this site has blended into the rest of the Lower West Avenue's neighborhood today, at one time, this was a prominent complex for a 29-year-old doctor and his family. Richard Kletting designed these buildings as a complex to work together, especially where coordinating efficient horse and buggy transportation was challenging at that time. Things are much different now. But therefore, we hope that you will keep in mind that, these, that historically these sites were connected through ownership and use. Unfortunately, as Kelsey's explained, and as you've read in the packet, reconstruction of the carriage house has not been possible, and the remainder of the carriage house has deteriorated. There are three primary issues at play here. As, as many properties in the avenues, the property at 222 Fourth Avenue is a non-conforming size lot, being below 5,000 square feet. Secondly, the applicant, while, not, while the owner of the property does not live on the property, he lives adjacent and does not desire to go through a lot line adjustment or combined lot. And lastly, existing zoning regulations and ordinances do not allow for reconstruction and or for use as a resident. And these are detailed well on pages two and three of the staff report and include the recently implemented ADU ordinance. As an example of how this text amendment could be applied in this specific case, the applicant has provided detailed information in the application as to what he desires to make application for in the future. The applicant fully understands that this is not an approved plan and would need to go through the proposed HLC design review process, but he wanted to make sure that with the considerable planning he's done in advance of making this application for the text amendment, that we believe this is useful information for the commission to understand this specific case. The proposed use is residential. We believe that residential use makes sense because you need to have economic return to make rehabilitation financially feasible. Use cannot be as a non-income producing accessory structure, we believe. A tool shed won't justify rehab or reconstruction and you'll lose more historic buildings like these, like these carriage houses. We believe that this idea in the text amendment promotes the city's adopted direction in several areas. Residential use and rehabilitation of historic structures as proposed with this text amendment go hand in hand and are supported by several associated city policies and plans. These are detailed on pages 165 to 167 of the staff report. Lastly, we acknowledge that what is presented to you today is a limited scope proposal. In an early 2019 meeting with planning director, Nick Norris, the applicant was guided to prepare a text amendment proposal with a narrow focus. We believe we've satisfied that request per that guidance. Historic carriage houses are already rare across the city. The documentation required by this proposal adds a layer of required documentation for historic sites to be eligible under this text amendment. So it's not just any old carriage house. We strongly desire to keep that limited scope to get this passed. The owner has been working on this issue for over 10 years, and this is the first meaningful and positive movement toward resolving this unique issue and gets us closer to the realization of restoring the Beer Estate. To that end this evening, we're seeking Historic Landmarks Commission approval and a positive recommendation to move this application forward to Planning Commission. And that wraps up my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Huffaker. Appreciate that. Uh, did you say Mr. Pace would like to speak as well? Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Please proceed, Mr. Oh, Pace. good. Okay, I uh, had a difficulty joining the conference, so I uh, came in about 20 minutes late or 20, uh, 
10 to 7. So, uh, but I don't think I missed very much. Uh, let me just say a few remarks on this thing as a longtime property owner and supporter of preservation in, in all, I guess, in all forms in the avenues. Uh, 222 Fourth Avenue uh, consists, as I believe it was Kelsey was speaking. I, I have no video in front of me, so if that if that makes a difference, the video is not working. Uh, the uh, uh, that building on the lot was uh, built a. Apparently in 1867, it has a footprint of about uh, 500 square feet. Uh, it's on an 8,000 square foot lot, which is, I'm sure you're aware, is pretty big for the avenue. So it's about 7% of that, uh, uh, the 222 lot has been built on. The carriage house portion is uh, five, about 5,000 plus square feet. As far as I can tell, that is the is, uh, Hello. I'm sorry. I'm hearing crosstalk. I can you hear me? Uh, please repeat the last couple of sentences, Mr. Pace. Yes, there okay. was. There was. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, the uh, the carriage house portion of the 222 lot is 5,000 or so square feet. It's all in one lot. Uh, it is, as far as I can tell, the closest uh, unused level space that's within walking distance of downtown. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it has, uh, in effect, become a dead asset. Uh, there was a zoning change after I purchased it that apparently killed it. Uh, as far as I can tell, there's no reasonable economic use for that property other than as some sort of infill housing. Neither the city nor the architects I've consulted or anybody else has been able to propose an alternative except to donate it to the city where they could perhaps build a vegetable patch uh, and maybe a fence to keep uh, strangers out of my backyard. I uh, politely declined that, uh, that honor. Now, Salt Lake County lists 132 single family homes uh, surrounding the 222 Fourth Avenue uh, existing building in that neighborhood. For 131 of those 132 houses, uh, the uh, housing value, assessed value, reliably exceeds the land value. Uh, so the value is, is, as far as the county is concerned, is in the buildings. Uh, for the 222 house, uh, the land, the housing value has ranged from 5% to 25% of the land value for the last four years. So I'm left in a situation where I've got about 8% of the land on the block in that 222 lot, but I got less than 1% of the population in the living space. Um, the point then is that uh, as a land use strategy, if this makes any sense to, the, to any of you folks, uh, I'd love to hear what it, it does. I guess uh, it makes no sense to me. I'm more like a victim of it. Uh, the second thing is I've discussed this uh, with the adjoining property owners. As you'll see in the back of the application, those folks are 100% uh, in support of my proposal, and I've walked the ground with most of them so they know exactly what I wanted to build. Uh, as I've talked to the neighbors, neighborhood on this, done in-person reviews with these folks, everybody that's uh, questioned me closely on it has asked the same question. And that is, well, if the carriage house was legal when it was built, and it's still there, and the lot was big enough to rebuild on when you bought the property, which it was, the standard was 4,000 feet then, and you want to exactly copy the original design, why do you need a zoning change? Uh, the only answer that uh, I've got for them, for the neighbors, is that I don't know. Uh, the city's response to this question has been, quote, and, I've, and it's in writing, it doesn't matter. No, that's not an answer, obviously. Uh, I guess that's the city's story, and they're sticking to it. 
Now, we propose the third point, we've proposed a meticulous rebuild of a Richard Cletting building at 222 4th Avenue. As I'm sure you're aware, there are not many of those left. And as the city is well aware, its failure to do any restoration or stabilization of the Albert Fisher estate that is owned for about 15 years out by the Jordan River, coupled with the recent earthquake, uh, apparently means that it, it may have been neglected beyond the point of repair. Uh, the uh, uh, wooden components of the, the, of the Fisher building are rotting and it's brick and stone, which has been overlaid with a whole lot of surplus concrete, uh, is stinking not too slowly into the Jordan River mud. Now, I oppose, I think, applying the proposed zoning change to uh, carriage houses that are not on the National Register. Salt Lake City's records of its historic properties are... Uh, messy and unreliable to allow anybody to conveniently identify uh, what carriage houses there are. And I've done some uh, some further investigation of that. I think a national register listing requiring that for a carriage house to rebuild will require an independent review of what's real uh, on the various sites. I think national register listing for a new property can be pursued either by the owner or by the uh, the city independently if the city wants to do it. I think this can facilitate quality control and mistake avoidance in the decision in all kinds of decisions that the city is making. So, in closing, uh, I want to note that uh, we've been through this uh, zoning rodeo before. Although the city says the current zoning does not allow a rebuild, uh, it also passed an ordinance saying that these specific buildings, the ones that are in the Beer Estate, should be preserved. Uh, in fact, it felt so nice the city actually passed that ordinance twice and never revoked it. I am hoping that the third time will be the charm and we can get a uh, process started that will allow this building to uh, to be restored. Um, so that's all I have in way of presentation. I'd be glad to take questions or give up the floor to whoever should get it next. Thank you, Mr. Pace. Um, actually, I, I, I will open some questions. We'll allow uh, commissioners to ask questions of you and Mr. Huffaker and uh, planning staff. First question I'd, I'd want to start with is, well, we're talking about changing an ordinance which applies to the city, to the historical areas of the city. Your comments have pretty much all been focused on your property, and rightly so, because that's what uh, where your interests lie. How does the proposal you've put before us how is that good for the city as a whole? Well, the, the city as a whole, I guess, consists of a bunch of, uh, of buildings. Uh, there are very few National Register uh, historic properties, with uh, carriage houses, that are listed in the city. Uh, if there are more uh, than we've been able to identify them, uh, I think those uh, people should feel welcome to either apply by themselves for a National Register listing uh, to verify the, what's real on the property. And, uh, and if they are troubled by doing that or don't want to do it, the city can apply on their behalf independently for National Register. So I'd see this as being citywide. Uh, the point is that there just aren't very many uh, carriage houses uh, that are as well documented that are, uh, are in existence in the city that have passed the National Register test. Thank you. In, in the in the document that staff has prepared, I think they identified five other carriage houses. Are all of those five also on the national register? Uh, four of them definitely are. The perhaps soon to be defunct Fisher House the city owns definitely is. The 
Kearns Mansion and Carriage House uh, is on it. The Keith Brown Carriage House and Mansion are on it. My property is on it. I believe the McIntyre House by LDS Hospital on 7th Avenue and uh, and B Street is probably on it, although the documentation for uh, from the county says that the carriage house was constructed in 1950. So all, if they wanted to, uh, the owners of that property did want to uh, rebuild it, they would uh, have to apply and you know clarify when it was built. Uh, if it's not on the register, the register documentation was unclear on this, uh, then they could apply to the register. I've been on, uh, my properties have been on the register for 43 years, I think. So uh, a delay of a year uh, for to have a register listing does, does not shock me. Okay. Um, hey, Kenton, could I? Piggyback on your yeah, question. Yeah, I was just going to open up. Go for it, Paul. Um, so, it, as I read the proposal, anyway, I, I wanted to phrase your, I think, the same question you were just asking in a different way. Um, because as I read the proposal, it is not citywide. It's limited. It would be applicable to only four zones. It's RMF 35, RO, I, and one other, I forget what it is. And I was I was trying to figure out what the rationale is for picking those zones other than, you know, this well, property is zoned I, I believe those are the only zones that uh, uh, meet the uh, documentation requirements for a carriage house being there and it's listed in the, that are listed in the National Register. I'm sure there were a great many carriage houses uh, for in probably the more affluent parts of town historically. I think most of them don't survive. You know, the Devereaux House, for example, had all kinds of outbuildings around it, a carriage house, a couple of stables, a greenhouse, many sheds. Uh, the Brigham Young Complex, whatever that exactly includes, undoubtedly had some uh, private transportation. But uh, I don't think the records that uh, the city maintains are such that it's adequate. That they're just not adequate to tell what was there originally. I don't know how to go out and investigate those houses other than knocking on every door that looks like it might have been on a big enough lot once to have had a carriage house uh, associated with it and ask or maybe go or maybe survey or maybe go dig to tell. Uh, I don't think that's a reasonable burden uh, for us to undertake. I think we've provided a reasonable way for the city to get at that information for anybody who can document a carriage house and who wants to rehabilitate it. If I could just any zoning restriction at all. Okay. Say that again. Excuse me. I I just don't. If that's the case, why would we limit it to only four zones? Why not just do it? Yeah, if, if, you've got you've got to be able to prove the existence of the uh, carriage house. For example, take the uh, the Devereaux house. All of the outbuildings on the Devereaux house have disappeared, I believe, under the. Uh, KSL headquarters and a couple of other buildings. I don't think that you could you could find anything. Maybe there's some stuff there that would allow somebody to propose it. But uh, you know, and if they could convince the National Register uh, Department of the Interior that uh, those buildings were real and you could define what they look like, you could define what they look like in some kind of terms, then sure. Let them get registered. I am not saying that this should be the end all of uh, preservation for these kinds of buildings or you know, maybe even for other kinds of accessory structures. I'm saying I've been uh, try, trying to restore this property for a great many years and this is and I'm not getting any younger and this would be a place to start and you could add to it as time goes on if the need of, if uh, further text amendments were warranted. Could, can I just jump in for a moment? So, yes. Uh, planning the planning division does keep fairly thorough records of landmark sites, Salt Lake City landmark sites. 
And staff did initial research on how many of those landmark sites had some sort of carriage house feature. The list is fairly substantial. Um, however, not all of those sites would meet the eligibility requirements proposed by the applicant. So the limited zoning districts and then the being listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, could I could I respond to that, please? Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, Two years ago, uh, when I was uh, started thinking about a text amendment, I sat down with Mr. Norris, the director of planning, who told me, no, 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 we'd love to help you out, but your property is not listed on the National Register because it's not on our zoning maps. Uh, I said, au contraire, here's the National Register documentation, here are the code numbers, it is on the National Register. Mr. Norris ended up later that day saying, excuse me all the hell, you know, you're correct. Uh, a year ago, I had a meeting with Ms. Octe, a telephone meeting with Ms. Octe and Mr. Patterson, who launched into the same discussion that I'd had earlier with resolved with Mr. Mor with Mr. Norris that well it's not on the zoning map so it can't possibly be a real carriage house. I had an attorney sitting with me then and I didn't want to pay the attorney several hundred bucks an hour to settle something that I thought we'd already settled. Uh, last month I went back to the zoning maps. Now this is two years later and this uh, the 222 Fourth Avenue is still not listed as a historic site. Now, as far as I can tell, it's the director of zoning and the assistant director of zoning, and I'm not sure what Mr. Patterson's position was. If they had been aware that the records are no good for the for my property for years now and have not taken action to change the zoning maps, then it's pretty hard to have much uh, confidence in doing any kind of research the zoning map based because it's just manifestly inaccurate. All right, thank you for those thoughts, Mr. Pace. I'm not sure it's exactly cogent to the, uh, the text of this proposed amendment, but it certainly is. Mr. Pace, I'll let you back. Um, but it definitely seems like something that needs to be addressed within the city. So the commission would request planning staff to uh, address those issues. Go ahead, Mr. Pace, if you have something else. Uh, not unless you have questions for me. Other commissioners, questions for Mr. Pace, Mr. Huffaker, or for Planner Lindquist? I have one more up there, if no one else is. Looks like you're up, Paul. Yeah. Um, I am really confused by the uh, request, and I was hoping maybe one of you, the applicant or the representative, could clarify. Um, throughout the discussion, you you've referred to the to the project you're proposing as a restoration, um, and to me that indicates that you're renovating a structure that exists. But when I compare the drawings that you're proposing to the, I don't know if you can call it a structure anymore, but to the thing that was a structure on the, at the back of 222, it, they are totally different. One is, you know, quintessential cladding with the steepled roof and uh, similar to the building in back of the B Street house in, in, a, in a way. And the thing that is there now is like a big rectangular horse barn looking thing. So are you, are you starting from scratch or what? Uh, no, uh, the, uh, the bricks that, uh, uh, the, 1899 carriage house was built from all survive on site. I don't think it was a few of them may have been carried away uh, over the years, but they never hauled a brick out of this place. The uh, walls are uh, uh, about 70 percent, uh, maybe a little more than that, uh, in their original locations. 
Um, so the uh, uh, the wooden part of the structure in the front, uh, which would have been mainly doors, is, is of course gone. The floors are uh, uh, are there. Uh, some of the floors were dirt, but their uh, floors are probably still usable, at least in part. And um, we can document exactly what the roof looked like. Uh, the photograph that you see in there, uh, we geo uh, scanned uh, from the Anderson Tower site was there and you can uh, uh, the proposal that uh, we've made is using the original materials that survive on site as much as possible and I and the original building footprint and I think it's accurate within oh six inches and probably a little less than six inches to what cladding actually designed um, I'm even more confused now um... I'm wondering if I'm even thinking of the same building. Did you say that 60 to 70% of the walls are in place? Yes. The uh, bricks, are you talking well, about the bricks, the, yeah, yeah, the bricks have been that, uh, some the of building some that's of the on the screen are, right now. Is that what we're talking me? about? I can't see the screen. I've got no video here at all. I'm not sure what you're pointing at. How about Kirk? Uh, Mr. Huffaker, are you able to see the screen? Looks like he might have gone uh, walkabout. Uh, well, Mr. Pace, what we're seeing is a photograph of the carriage house showing the three bays uh, where presumably the carriages went in. There's a straight facade with a rectangular window above it. And it's. Uh, it's all wood structure. A, is that the, well, if you're looking at the 195 labeled photograph, uh, which is the close up from uh, the uh, Anderson Tower, uh, uh, blow up at the, from Anderson Tower of what the carriage house looked like. Uh, now, that is not the. What we're Excuse me. That is not the photograph we're looking at. Uh, I believe it's it's hand labeled. I believe it's page five in the. No, uh, I understand energy. which photograph you're talking about. I'm talking about another photograph. It's the one that's uh, labeled National Register nomination photo of the Cledding Carriage House. Oh, okay. Um, that what that photograph involves is they they cut the. Uh, uh, front the uh, wooden part of the carriage house off in World War, approximately World War One, because draft animals were no longer popular in the avenues. And then they took the bricks uh, that they had taken from uh, partially the front of the uh, structure, and they built a shed roof <clears throat> with, uh, on the east side of it, using the original bricks. It's very clear if you look at it on site. I'd be glad to show it to you if anybody wants to see it. And then on the uh, the west side of the carriage house, they took the other set of bricks that they'd, sol they'd salvaged from the front and built an interior wall to replace a what apparently deteriorated wooden wall on the inside and then they left a uh, and then they took the rest of the uh, bricks that were there and built a uh, a western wall on a shed roofed area to store uh well it would have been garages at that point to uh where the uh, carriages were stored now if you're looking at the 195 picture i think you can see just barely in it you can see a wagon parked uh in front of uh, the west side bay of the uh, carriage house I don't know exactly what the uh, the north side looked like in terms of window spacing and doors and so on, although they were that was clearly where they were. Uh, on the south side, all of the original uh, openings are still there. On the east side, there apparently were no openings. And uh, on the west side, it was it was built in frame that's since been replaced by salvaged brick from the original building. Uh, Paul, Paul, could I contribute a little bit to that too? Yes, please proceed. I'm back. Yeah, yes, I am here. Um, 
so um, I, I apologize for the confusion in the terminology. Um, there, there is a little bit of a debate as to exactly how we categorize this. Is it re restoration, is it rehabilitation, or is it reconstruction? Um, it, it is a little bit of really all three of those definitions um, because it is not purely any one of them only. Um, so I think in terms of, of preservation, this is a little bit of a hybrid. Um, uh, you know, the goal is, of course, to get back to that that circa 1900 look of the cladding building, utilizing as much of the existing material on the existing footprint that exists uh, as possible. Do you agree with the assertion that 60 to 70 percent of the original walls are intact on the site? The, the bricks are there. I, they're not in. They're not intact. Well, that's not what you said. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I misspoke then. Um, Kelsey, could you go to that other photograph that is the photo taken from the tower showing a different building than the one is, that is on screen? The one. So that, thank you. So is that, that apparently house in the foreground? And that's still there. Are we seeing the north facade of yes. facing 4th Avenue? Yes, that is 222 4th Avenue. That's considered okay. the harness shop. And what is that? The, the red arrow is pointing to a chimney. <laughs> well, it's, it's trying to point to a roof. <laughs> in, that large, in the large structure behind the 222 4th house, is that? Yeah, it's this structure. Can you see? What I'm highlighting here, this structure. Yes. So that yeah. structure, that's what is being considered the carriage house. That's correct. the cladding carriage house, that's correct. And that appears to exceed the size of the main house. Perhaps it's, uh, correct. is, is that? Well, the, main, the main house is the, the beer mansion on B Street, which I think you can see a corner of in that, in that photograph, but, uh, uh, no, it does not exceed the size of the beer house in any sense. Okay, so, so that's how the big footprint. Beer house would be off to the left of in this photograph. Yes, what the beer Kenton, what what you're seeing in front of that in this photograph is what is referred to as the harness shop. Wh which one is the harness shop, please? The, the one in front of the carriage house in this photograph that fronts uh -huh. that fronts onto fourth avenue got it okay we, we believe but cannot prove that cladding uh designed the remodel of that which is an 1860s building uh because it was not a dwelling unit in 1895 which is the older picture the oldest picture we've got of it but it definitely was in 1900. okay so where that the wood structure, the the very agricultural horse barn style shed roof structure, constructed of wood, where is that with respect to the image we're now looking at? I can't tell what image you're looking at. I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Sorry, it's right. It's right here. That Kenton, that is the building, supposedly. That that's what's left of the carriage house back here. Um, and let me take you back to the so that's this. Okay. That picture was that picture is July 15th, 195. Okay. So hey Kelsey. Yes. Yeah. Do you have by any chance, do you have a picture of the current condition? I believe it's in your packet, um, but I can pull one up. I think that would be really helpful to put people in, yeah, put people in understanding of what. Yeah, in our packet on page 54, there is a color photograph showing, it says 2018 restored. And I'm not really clear where that is. And I apologize, I was not able to visit the site. 
So uh, oh, that is the uh, that is the workshop garage, uh, I believe. On uh, if it's painted red with some yellow and purple stripes on it, yeah. that is the that is the uh, one eighty one B Street workshop garage. Got it. That that's the one, Mister Pate. Yes, that's that's uh, something I built in. Uh, well, I remodeled the. 1899 workshop shed, approximately 1899 workshop shed, in 2004, and built that. It appears as a design exemplar in the city's uh, guidelines for how to build how to build structures that are compatible with uh, main with big houses. How to build accessory structures that are compatible with big houses. Okay, got it. Now I'm I'm thinking, and other commissioners correct me if I'm wrong. I think we might be. Well, all this is relevant to this Mr. Pace's property and the buildings on it. We are digressing a little bit from what's to be the focus of this discussion, and that is the text of the ordinance. It's, I think it's pretty clear how uh, Mr. Pace and Mr. Huffaker would like to apply it to this property. I think we got to get into the meat of the, of the wording itself and decide uh, what we think of it, if it's reasonable and relevant, and what sort of suggestions we would make to them. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess okay. before we do that, that would be more of our, our executive session. Is Michaela or, or Kelsey trying to say something there? It was Jessica. Jessica. Yes, um, actually, I do have a few questions for, I, I believe, probably for staff, because I think my questions are geared a little bit more broadly. Great. Please proceed. Okay, so a couple of questions. The first I wanted to ask about, um, and I guess this sort of does pertain to this particular property, but um, regarding if, if it's, and I guess this might come into play you know as far as specifically if it's going to be considered an accessory dwelling unit um if the footprint is demolished uh, or if the building is demolished and reconstructed would it not make more sense for the footprint or or i guess maybe i should word this differently what is the reasoning um behind approving potentially approving for it to um, have the same footprint if it's being completely demolished and reconstructed rather than um, abiding by the ADU requirements? Well, the ADU requirements, uh, I believe, uh, have size restrictions on them that relate to the uh, small uh, harness shop houses, we've called it, on 222 Fourth Avenue. So if uh, you were going to strictly go by the accessory dwelling unit construction uh, requirements, you would have approximately a, instead of a 1600 square feet or thereabout footprint, you would have a 600 or so uh, square foot building. And of course that would have nothing to do with the restoration of, uh, or with trying to replicate what Cledding had built. And, you know, quite frankly, I'd have no interest in, in, uh, in participating in building that. It would be worthless. Okay. Yeah, so just, and just to clarify, I think I'm asking, um, I, I think staff more um, just, and, and specifically the ADU requirement is 650 square feet, not to, um, not to be greater than 50% of the primary residence's footprint. Um, 650 square feet um, is, is pretty standard, um, you know, as far as the ADU requirements. Um, and, and then again, we're getting into, you know, this was also discussed in staff report, the concern about setbacks and height and, you know, how that impacts neighboring properties and understanding that in this very specific case, um, the applicant has has spoken to neighbors, but that's not to say that neighbors are not going to sell their house and <clears throat> new new owners are going to be in the neighborhood. So just going back to that, you know, um, what's the reasoning behind us considering approving 
this specific um, request when it goes against what the citywide ADU requirements are? Well, if I could respond to that, uh, the uh, city, this was built, I believe, the, all four structures were built uh, or, and in one case, remodeled by cladding in 1898 and 1899, there was no reference to zoning. The idea of ADU would have meant absolutely nothing to Cladding. Uh, and if, uh, and he was looking at it and they are, were all named to the National Register because Mr. Wilson Martin, who was the State Historic Preservation Officer at the time, strongly recommended that I put them all on because they were uh, created as a package by uh, by cladding. So that was why they were nominated. Uh, so if a uh, uh, an ADU in, that is sized based on the, uh, the very small uh, size of the uh, carried uh, the uh, harness shop house, as we've called it, uh, if uh, that's what you recommend, as I say, that, ha that is, has uh, building a, a 600 square foot uh, building in back of an 800 square foot building on an 8,000 square foot lot doesn't make much sense to me. It's certainly you know, not a, uh, a very promising use of my capital. So I'll just jump in and, and try to address some of your questions, Jessica. Uh, so the ADU ordinance um, didn't didn't meet the applicant's needs essentially. So this is what they're proposing to meet his needs. Um, the 650 square feet, you're right. It's fairly standard. It's 50% of the principal structure um, or up to 650 square feet. Additionally, there's there was an issue which was discussed in the staff report about owner occupancy. Um, which was challenging to get around for this um, because the owner does not live on site. He lives, you know, it's, it's touching the property, <laughs> but not on site. Um, and then also the size limitations, which I know that Landmarks does have some flexibility in addressing some of those size limitations, but staff was evaluating this in the sense of um, it, it could be a, a great incentive to restore some of these historic features on landmark sites uh, through allowing a, a dwelling unit outside of the ADU ordinance with those restrictions. And so um, I, I don't know if that answers all your questions, Jessica. If I missed one, <laughs> let me know. Yeah, that does actually. And I'm glad that you brought up the owner occupancy because that was actually my second question. And, um, and I, I guess I'm thinking a little bit, you know, kind of back in time to when the city in general wrote those, you know, wrote the, the ADU requirements. And I'm wondering how, what the reasoning is to get around the owner occupancy portion of that as well. I guess I can kind of understand the footprint aspect of it, um, you know, but to me, it seems like you know, even if we were to approve the the footprint um, portion of this request, that um, that it still seems to me that we should um, you know, we should be looking at the setback requirements as well as the height requirements and those kinds of things to you know to avoid impeding on neighboring properties. So that's my opinion. But I would also like to know about um, kind of the thoughts around the owner occupancy aspect of it. So when you say the owner occupancy aspect, this is Nick Norris, by the way, um, are you talking about the owner occupancy as it would relate, is the ADU ordinance would relate to this? Yes, that's correct. That's what I'm wondering is because, you know, we're, we're looking to possibly override some of the city ADU requirements. So on that one specifically, um, what, what are the thoughts, uh, you know, how, what's the reasoning behind allowing that to go through when it's specifically regulated under the citywide um, ADU ordinances? Well, I think this proposal is looking at a different of expanding the toolkit that the city has to potentially preserve historic buildings. And so that, at least un, under this proposal, that would, that would take precedent over um, 
the desire that the city council put into the ADU ordinance for owner occupancy. Um, and before I move on, Commissioner um, Mora would as her hand raised, so I'm gonna unmute her and let her speak. Hi there. Um, actually, going back to basics, um, I was wondering where the definition of carrot house was the source of that was. Um, and if they could expand on the definition of house servants as well. Uh, I don't know about the others. I couldn't quite understand what I couldn't you understand. Say. Could you repeat that, please? We are provided with a definition of air quality applicants. And I was just wondering what the source of that definition was. Because um, that's the definition that would be used in the text. Is that correct? Um, and in that definition, it's also included house servants towards the end of the paragraph. And so I was just wondering if they could expand on the definition of those two terms, what the source was, and what the meaning behind it is. Kelsey, can you respond? I cannot address that question. That definition was uh, provided to staff, so I will actually allow Kirk to address how they developed the definition for carriage house. Very good, Mr. Huffaker. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I was just actually looking up that definition um, and where I got it. It actually came from the Cincinnati uh, Landmarks Ordinance. Um, as far as carriage house, and then I made just a, a couple of language adjustments um, just to, to reflect the, the more local um, um, situation, um, you know, with Salt Lake. Okay. Um, I have uh, kind of a technical question for staff. In the, in the staff report under the heading applicability, it says, the Historic Landmark Commission does not have the authority to review alterations to properties listed on the National Register of Historic Places. However, the proposal encompasses properties listed on both the National Register of Historic Places and properties listed as Salt Lake City landmarks. That, how do we rectify that if we can't, if this is on the National Register, and we're not supposed to be able to uh, uh, um, I've just forget the word there uh, to review alterations. Can you speak to that, please? Of course. Or Kelsey. Please. Oh, sorry, Nick. I don't <laughs> either one. Okay, I'll go. Um, so staff staff is concerned. alterations. However, um, in that concern was a little bit eased because the additional requirement is for it to be a, a local landmark site, which does fall under your authority to review alterations. Um, I, I think it, it is a little troubling to have the requirement also be a National Register site, which is why I brought it up in the staff report. Uh, got it. Yeah, that was a question I had too. Mm -hmm. Okay, at this point, uh, if, do any of the other commissioners have questions for the applicant or the planner in charge? Is it Mike? Can you hear me now, Kenton? Yes, loud and clear. Right. When when uh, when Kurt was Mr. Helfiker was was presenting, he talked about the a light a lot line adjustment or lot vacation was was not going to be pursued. Um, I, can you speak just a little bit more about that? Because I'm I'm a little bit unclear uh, on if that's not going to be pursued. How what, what's the access to to the property properly? Uh, this is Kirk. I'll let Stephen answer most of it, but the access to this property is off of Fourth Avenue and it's not off of B Street. And so the plan is that you could access both of the buildings on this property from a 
um, from a driveway access that comes off of 4th Avenue um, to the back of the property. And there's plenty of room to do that. Okay, so it's a so it so just to be clear, it would be a shared uh, driveway past the first house to the carriage house. That's correct. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, at this point, then I will open it up to public comment. Is there anyone out there in WebEx land from the public who would like to? make any statements regarding this proposal? Yes, we do have um, Cindy Cromer. Cindy, I'm unmuted you. Excellent, Perhaps Cindy. Um, can you hear me? It looks like I'm still muted. We can hear you. Or we could. Hang on, just a second. All right, go ahead. I apologize for not having these comments in writing. Um, first of all, my name is Cindy Cromer and the nearest property I own is on 4th Avenue on the west side of the 4th Avenue stairs. I am very familiar with um, the um, harness shop. Um, it's one of my favorite buildings in the avenues. Um, and um, I'm also a big fan of accessory structures, as some of you know. Um, this ordinance amendment is highly specific to this one parcel. And I was uh, disappointed when I heard that the proposal was for a single family residence because I think of a stable as lending itself to multiple units. Um, there are, are a number of programmatic issues here that um, should have been dealt with long, long ago, such as a density bonus for historic preservation. I believe that you should have the authority to waive the ridiculous obstacles in front of this property owner as you do the stupid setback requirements associated with the zoning ordinance. And we can look at the new infill houses that have resulted in the historic districts as a result of your ability to waive those setback requirements. And they're just glorious. So I'm looking for you to have more authority to do things to preserve or in this case, reconstruct historic structures. Um, it's very hard for me in the context of what's going on now to look at this and go, that this is the best way to get there. If this were my property, and again, I would love to own the harness shop, um, I would um, create a plan development and then condominiumize the different properties and define their land um, associated with each condominium parcel and be done with this. Um, but that is not what the property owner wants to do. And in the context of other things that are occurring in this city, it's really extraordinary. I mean, the city council has approved a, a very aggressive RMU zone on South Temple in an R2 corridor. So just looking at how the city has been plucking individual zones and parking them in the midst of zones that have quite contrary purposes, I'm I'm bewildered, but would you please let Mr. Pace get on with it? He's my age, and we're not getting any younger. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Crowley. Appreciate your thoughts. Some interesting ideas. Uh, anybody else in the public wish to speak? I do not see um, anybody else, and. Um... Mr. Neil Tolley at the beginning of the meeting indicated that he did not want to speak. Um, so that's all we have. Okay, great. Could I ask one more question of staff before we move yeah. into executive session? Certainly, Paul, go. Um, Nick or Kelsey, uh, did you guys uh, look at, well, so as background, I, I'm correct that you guys are in the midst of a process of changing the RMF 30 zone, right? Yes. And and RMF 35, I understand, is to follow. 
Yes. Um, did you look at all at whether the the um, new allowances in the in the RMF thirty zone that's being proposed would would work for this proposal? I know we're in RMF thirty five here, but I, my yeah. understanding is that RMF thirty five will be similar to RMF thirty, maybe even a little more dense. Yes. Staff looked at everything. Um, I looked at an RMF 30 option. I looked at what Cindy suggested as the plan development. The property is not large enough to go through the plan development process. It doesn't meet the minimum size requirements. Um, and to combine the properties, he would need 15,000 square feet for the density as opposed to 10 because he'd have three single family dwellings. So. Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated each route you look into, but the RMF 30 um, was an option. However, the timeline is a little bit questionable for the RMF 30. It still hasn't been heard or briefed by the, the city council. And so um, th there's kind of an undefinable amount of time. He would be maybe more so in limbo going for an RMF 30, waiting for those changes, than going through a text amendment process. And even longer for RMF 35 if he w didn't want to do a zone change and wanted to wait for. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Thank mm -hmm. you. That makes that yeah. helps a lot. All right. Uh, I guess technically the, the applicant has a chance to respond to public comment before we go into executive session. Um, Mr. Pace and Mr. Huffaker, any last comments or responses to what Ms. Cromer had to say? Uh, well, in, in terms of the local uh, landmark designation, uh, I believe, you know, for your information, uh, and I'm not sure if this is the case anymore, but in the uh, 1970s, when the National Register started signing up uh, properties for uh, or was in the midst of uh, designating uh, national landmarks, the city ordinance, I believe from 1976, required that everything that was listed on the National Register uh, as a landmark would also be listed as a Salt Lake City rec Salt Lake City landmark separately. So I think they just automatically spilled onto the uh, and my property certainly did. They automatically spilled onto a list of Salt Lake City landmarks in about 1976. If I could contribute as well, um, I, yes, I think. Uh, Ms. Cromer's um, astute observation about this being an onerous um, issue, uh, I, I think is represented pretty well in the application and um, staff's questions. I mean, this is very complex to resolve a, a difficult issue that does have some application citywide, but you know, these buildings are rare. And we're asking the Historic Landmarks Commission to take the leadership role in um, in getting this uh, ordinance through and being able to apply it, um, apply it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Kelsey, we'll, we'll not go into executive session, but somewhat modified, we'll ask Kelsey to walk us through the questions and the, the issues that we need to discuss. Yes, let me just pull up my notes. Okay, and did you all get a chance to look at what the carriage house looks like in 2018, what I showed on that? Okay, perfect. Okay. All right. Well, so, hey, uh, could I just interject on that? You, you know, that I, I'm sure that was an accurate depiction of what it looks like and looked like in 2018, but it's not accurate now. Sure. The whole mm -hmm. structure has fallen over. Um, it is it, it completely collapsed. The roof is on the ground. Hmm. Um, and I don't want to jump the conversation, but one of my, I mean, real concerns about what's being proposed is that I, 
I, if this were a renovation, I would feel a lot better about it. To me, what's being kind of put forward as a restoration in this specific case isn't. I mean, that's going to be a completely new construction. And I, I feel like that's kind of at odds with what it, in, it, by sort of creating a replica of a cladding design, I feel like that's almost not what we, that's kind of the opposite of what we want. Um, we don't want false replicas of historic buildings, um, but ra prefer something that's a product of our own time. Mm -hmm. So I would be much more supportive of this if it were either limit, it, if we're going to focus only on historic carriage houses, which I think I'm starting to conclude, I think that's a mistake because it's just so, it feels like spot zoning. Mm -hmm. But um, it, if we were to limit it to carriage houses, I think I'd feel more comfortable if it were limited to renovations rather than these reconstructions, which are essentially going to be replicas of historic designs that will never be equal to what the original was. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you there, Paul. Uh, before our meeting, and when I was reading through the staff report, I did have uh, made a note that says, if no carriage house currently exists, why should a completely new structure be built? How is that historic? And uh, you know, I think that, that certainly applies here. At the same time, I, I would like, I, I think I agree with where the applicant's trying to go to make make financial sense of this his property. He's kind of caught in a catch twenty two back there. You know, I'd like to see if we can find a solution, but I'm not sure if it's really being done in the best way possible here. Uh, that said, Kelsey, do you want to go on, please? Okay. So. Okay, so in regard to the purpose statement, uh, does the HLC agree with this statement or is there anything that staff should add or consider? Would you uh, run us through those again? Because I go back to the... Of course, yeah, they are... Uh, incentivize the preservation and restoration of a historic feature on a landmark site. Add to the housing units within Salt Lake City while respecting the appearance and scale of the single family residential neighborhoods. Uh, sustainability objectives are supported by utilizing an existing structure or elements of an existing structure and increase the economic viability of historic properties and further the city's historic preservation goals. Commissioners, what do you think of those? I don't think the proposal as it's written achieves those goals, especially, I think it was number, one, number three. Um, I, uh, we're not, as this particular application shows, we're not preserving the historic structure. We're creating a completely new construction replica. Okay. Um, that I the point before, so I'll I'll let it go at that. Yeah. But what about the other carriage houses to which this ordinance would apply, like the one over at Fisher Mansion or something like that? I in for in a macro view, I find those guiding purposes to to be in accordance with the balancing of historic preservation and the pressures on our city. I, I actually like those purposes. I'm not sure that this particular application meets it. Like you said, I'm willing to have that discussion. But there are some carriage houses, like I'm, as a West Side dweller, I love that Fisher Mansion carriage house. I want that to be preserved. Oh, and, and who doesn't? But I can tell you one thing that's never gonna happen. The city is never gonna have a college renter at the Fisher Mansion. Governor Herbert is never going to re renovate his carriage house and have some tenant there overnight. And neither is Annette Cumming at the Keith Brown mansion. 
So <laughs> the only property that this applies to practically, I, I think, is the one we're talking about. Mr. Chair, Herbert might find an intern he really likes. I don't know, and, and who knows what Spencer Cox will do. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, just I wanted to add a little context because the Secretary of the Interior Standards does include standards for reconstruction, particularly when um, the reconstruction of a structure is helpful to. Um, understanding the historic use of a property. And when you're talking about a site such as this, such as the beer property, um, where these outbuildings were a part of the history of that site and over time they've been <laughs> repurposed and reused and had things build up around them, reconstruction could be a, a legitimate preservation purpose for those types of situations. I think that's one of the reasons why focusing on a landmark site is appropriate versus focusing it on can do also include contributing structures. Yeah. Well, okay. well, on, Thanks. Sorry. Please, Jessica, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, on those, you know, on that same line of thinking, um, Nick, um, it, to me, it seems like the you know, I guess the intended definition of reconstruction is for the same use. Does that not apply or do you see that differently? Nick, did I, guess, I, I guess that's how we interpret that um, or how it works within Salt Lake City. And that's part of up, up to your, your guidance. Okay, uh, just to, let me interrupt with a point of uh, procedure here. S Commissioners, some, somebody's got some noise in the background that is making it hard to hear others. Please be sure when you're not uh, speaking to mute your microphone. Thank you. Okay, uh, so I, I think that what I heard there is we, we might have some particular issues with reconstruction versus restoration, but uh, I, I believe that the the purpose, the overall purpose uh, would, would allow us to proceed and then we can pick on, if it goes forward, we can pick on particular sites or applications and, and uh, debate and fine tune whether it's a reconstruction or a restoration and body not with that. that. That makes sense? Okay, good. Kelsey, please continue. Okay, in regard to the definitions, the applicant only provided the definition for carriage house, which Kirk um, explained where he had received that definition. Should Historic footprint also be defined as part of this proposal, since the historic footprint is kind of that framework of what this carriage house can can reside within. And are there other definitions or terms that could potentially be helpful? I'm hearing, you know, maybe referring to the Secretary of the Interior Standards for restoration, reconstruction. Those are, those are the questions, sorry. Okay. Um, I think for me, again, going back to my comments on setbacks, and I know that we've, you know, previously been able to um, override items like that. I guess my biggest concern, at least as far as the historic footprint is concerned, is is kind of the overall massing and scaling of the, of the, um, the reconstructed or remodeled or refurbished building. This whole issue is reminding me, did, did the other commissioners remember like, I don't know, a few months ago we had in the avenues, it was one of the field last field trips we were all able to go on, um, that garage that was behind the structure, it was a detached garage. And we had, um, I think, approximately 75% of the avenues show up to comment on how the back lean to wasn't actually part of the historic footprint. So as they were gonna reconstruct, we had to 
it was a really contentious long meeting about what constituted the historic footprint and um, if they were going to take it down, if they should be able to raise it back up to the same height as it currently was because it was blocking so many different angles of light and, and all of this. Um, my concern would be that we would just create another ambiguous thing that would cause really contentious HLC meetings that really are difficult to satisfy anyone um, because we're trying to customize a request for one particular person's modification. Um, it feels a little bit to me, and maybe I'm missing something, like we're using a hammer where we should be using a scalpel. Victoria, I'd actually like to add to that because I think that was the um, what the nature of my questions were regarding um, ADU requirements that are already in place. I understand Nick's comment about us wanting to, you know, um, increase the tools in our toolbox or however he put it, but, you know, I feel like we might end up just spending a lot of time debating things that a lot of time and effort had been previously put into. I know specifically with the ADU requirement specifically, that was a very long process. Yeah, Jessica, it was long and involved because it involved the whole city pretty much. And it was a pretty drastic change, uh, especially for areas where people were hesitant to increase density and and maybe change the, uh, so I say, the, the some would alter the identity of the, the, the social structure there. Uh, for better or for worse, we are really looking at pretty much one site where this will apply. And because we aren't able to, we aren't able to address this in the conventional historic landmarks form and the applicant is caught between zoning constraints and landmarks constraints. Uh, I, I don't think this will get to be such a big and contentious and overriding issue. Uh, it, this is an awkward way to address it, but I'm afraid I can't see any other way that uh, the applicant can go about trying to do this. I think there are many, many ways that it could happen. Um, it, it could be a, a modification of the ADU ordinance. Um, it could be a modification of RMF 35. Um, there are any number of other text amendments that could address the issues that have been raised um, that, and I think in my opinion, those paths forward would be better because they don't implicate the historic preservation concerns that have been expressed during this hearing. That's, those are good points, Paul. And I guess what I meant was I didn't see another way within the framework of Historic Landmarks Commission. You know, maybe this isn't the best way to go about it, but because it's sitting here in front of us, we've got to use the tool that we've got or adapt it. Uh, but that's not to say we can't send them all, suggest, suggest the other, another route like you have. I'd be, I think I'd be ready to make a motion if that's not premature. Uh, go, yeah, let's, let's hear what you have to say. All right, uh, I would move that the Historic Landmark Commission forward the following recommendation to the Planning Commission. Uh, one is that the commission generally is very uh, supportive of the applicant's goals of increasing density on his property and making his property more uh, economically sensible. Um, I think the uh, that's number one. Number two, the commission also uh, suggests that there are significant shortcomings with both procedural and substantive with the current zoning 
uh, ordinance that are preventing reasonable uh, development on properties like this. However, uh, three, um, this seems like an end around of the existing city ordinance regarding accessory dwelling units and uh, also RMF 35. And four, uh, this in this because the application of this ordinance is so limited, it feels like spot zoning, uh, and that can have unforeseen consequences uh, with respect to uh, future neighbors uh, and uh, a variety of circumstances that we don't uh, see here. So, uh, in summary, the. The commission forwards a negative recommendation with respect to this particular proposal, but urges the planning commission to consider other changes to perhaps the ADU ordinance or the RMF 35 ordinance uh, that would permit the applicant uh, uh, to move forward with uh, something like what he is proposing. Uh, uh, in a way that applies uh, more broadly to the city as a whole. Thank you, Paul. That's really interesting. Uh, I'd like each of the commissioners to say what they what they think about that before we go for a second on that. Uh, Rocio, could you? What do you think? Oof. <gasps> Um, a lot, a lot of things. I'm just processing still. Well, Kenton, I have a comment. Please. Uh, you know, and, 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 and I, I, I very much understand, you know, Paul's comment and, and, and I share a lot of his, uh, uh, uncertainty about this. I did go visit the site and I looked at it and I, and I tried to reconcile what's there. With with the drawings, you know that were in the packet. I mean, there's, you know, and 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 I always go back to, you know, what is historic preservation? You know, it's protecting local history through identification of unique places that tell our story. Well, you know, protecting local history is 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 one thing, but historic preservation is a process of protecting. There's 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 so little left of of what was once there. Um, I, I, and, and it, as uh, just like Paula is, I, 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 I admire trying to do something with this, uh, with this particular project. I've got the, the Google image up of, of this, this plot here and, you know, very, very characteristic with Salt Lake city. You have big, big square blocks and this, this structure is right in the middle of, of that block. Uh, you know, which made sense at one time when there was a collection of buildings all owned by one one entity. But, you know, over the course of time, things all the way around, you know, have have been, been you know, parceled and, and, and uh, you know, into to single family homes, apartments and so forth. So now there's this this thing in the middle of the site that wants to tell the story. But, but there's so little left. So I, I'm like, I, and, and there, there's a part of me that, that very much agrees with, with Paul in that I think there, there's an, perhaps not a historic avenue to, to, to bring value to, to what's right in the middle of this block. Does that make sense? It, it, I, I just think on the historic side, there's, there's you know, and, and, and I, I understand what, what the applicant had indicated that there's a lot of materials there. The bricks are still there. Uh, you know that 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 all of that could be used in the reconstruction. I understand what he's saying, but it it feels like like it's uh, you know it, it's new construction using existing materials, and I don't know how close that would be to the historic nature of the original project. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think there's other avenues that that could bring value to this property. The historic part. I, I I see less of because there's there's so little left of what was originally there. So then to continue that thought, Michael, are you suggesting, as Paul did, that going through the historic landmarks process to get a text amendment or 
some change within our capabilities is not the best way to accomplish this and the applicants should well, when, when, no, no, it's a good question. And when I want to go to what was asked for, you know, it's a zoning text amendment petition, uh, you know, to permit reconstruction of historic carriage houses, uh, you know, in, in, in any one of these, you know, RMF, uh, RO, you know, I and, and institutional districts. You know, so that's, that's all, and, and stopping right there. You know, do I think that that makes sense? I, I think that probably makes sense. For this particular site, I think there's 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 a lot more discussion. So should we be handing them off to planning commission or can we do it within our arena to make these, will, will the, the historic overlay have the ability to maybe this is more for planners again. Say yeah. we decided we love this proposal. We want to allow him to build something there, whether or not it's restoration or new construction, it doesn't matter. Right. Uh, we're okay with it with it violating current city ordinance because we think it it has some historic relevance can we do that and I, I i would agree with that and i think i support that technically nick or kelsey can it, it, make sure we understand is that a power we have to uh override the zoning ordinance Not for so, so you you only can in those instances that the ordinance gives you the authority to do it, and so in in this case, it the ordinance does give the landlords commission the authority to uh, increase the the density that would be allowed on the property, and that that's ultimately the core of the issue. Um, so that that would have to change for you to do that. But if the ordinance does do that, and it does give you authority, then you have that ability to, to do it, just like you do with setbacks and building heights and things like that, because that's specifically authorized for the commission to make those uh, adjustments. So I, I didn't quite catch the start. Do we or do we not have the ability to increase density in this location? The ordinance specifically says you do not have that authority to to change density. Okay, then why are we even hearing this? I, I guess I'm, I'm here. Because this, here would, this would be a proposal to give you the authority in limited circumstances to do that. <laughs> Wait, so we can give ourselves the authority? No, 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 no. This, you're, so only the city council can do that. Okay. You're a step in that process and this is going to the, the Landmarks Commission, then to the Planning Commission, then to the City Council for who ultimately will decide if they want the Landmarks Commission to have that authority or not. Got it. Okay. So then what Paul's saying makes sense, forwarding the, in my opinion, that we tell them we're, we're in favor of what is being proposed, the concept of being able to uh, increase density, uh, improve re respect, and improve historical uh, context. But we can't do it ourselves, so please, uh, please make it so we can do so. <laughs> I didn't say that well, but uh, other, other commissioners, I've, I've, been, I've been dominating this a little too much. Uh, Victoria? Have you had some thoughts on this? I think I'm in alignment with uh, what Paul and Mike said and, and what you just articulated. This doesn't, this, this feels like an awkward attempt to, like I, I get what we're doing super in support of the project, just don't see how our, it, it doesn't make sense. This isn't, this isn't a good fit. Okay, Jessica? I'm in agreement with 
everything that everybody has said thus far. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Paul, would you do? Uh, does Paul, do you need to uh, restate your motion at all, or do people feel like they uh, understand it well enough that we can take a second to it? Would anyone like to hear him restate that? Could I just chime in and ask for some clarification before? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you're in favor of removing the Landmark Commission's <laughs> review of this and having an alternate solution like a map amendment or addressing the ADU ordinance, at something a little bit on a broader scale than just through this proposed reconstruction of a historic carriage house tax amendment. Is that correct? That's a nice way of uh encapsulating it yeah okay. yeah i agree and if i could add also um i do want to say that i i am in support of changing some of the ad requirements as it is um i think one of the um the biggest hurdles is the owner occupancy um mm -hmm. you know that's a, a huge hurdle um so that i definitely think that there needs to be some modifications to the ADU ordinances. Yeah, I agree with you, Jessica, in the context of trying to make the city more inclusive, uh, you know, that, that owner occupancy can be, is, is a way of uh, giving, giving face value to trying to diversify occupancies while actually holding up a, a roadblock to a, a more general acceptance but that's not historic landmark uh, so let's move with paul's uh, motion anybody interested in giving us a second to paul's I'll motion? This is I'll the motion. very good we have a motion and a second i would like to take a vote vote on it please i will work from left to right on my screen mike Aye. Aye. Uh, well, Paul? Aye. Victoria? Aye. Jessica? Aye. Rocio? Aye. Well, I believe we have a unanimous passing of that motion. And unless there's been some uh, parliamentary screw up or something, I believe that uh, that closes this session. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good luck to the applicant as you go through this. I understand the frustration. Hope, wish, give you hopes for success, and hopefully we can see a, a proposal that we can actually give you some concrete response to. Thank you. This session is closed. <laughs>